properly. Well, so when we got in a system test, we tested differently. So what we did is we uh, had a separate IVR server that was the load generating host, and that was fully spewing out out of all the ports load into the system under test. So all the ports are loaded. Um, and as we uh, as we started uh, uh, increasing the, the load, then and stepping stepping up again, what happened was a big big crash. I mean, basically just a little bit over 50% load, and the system under test went over. So, you know, my my point about the load generators not being representative was actually, if anything, too gentle. Uh, they were they were almost non-existent. So, you know, this the, the previous slide that was an example of what's called intrusive load generation or self-generation of load, and it's just generally a bad idea because this goes all the way back to Boris Beiser's book, Software System Testing and Quality Assurance, where he said, look that. You don't want to do this because, again, you can't count on a, um, the load being created created by the load generator looking anything like the load that's going to be created by the, the software that's ultimately running on the system. So most of the time you want non-intrusive. And um, if you see someone testing in this unrealistic fashion with a lot of obvious artificiality, then you know, expect the, re the results to be misleading as, as the previous slide mentioned, uh, the development test results were quite misleading. Now, I'm not saying don't ever, ever use self-generated load. There can be some times when self-generated load will work. So load and reliability tests actually can use self-generated load in some cases. So an example of that, doing operating system testing on a networked version of Unix that ran in clusters of up to 31 systems. These clusters can consist of either mainframes or PCs or a mix of both. And um, <clears throat> what we did to try to test these load, load and reliability tests them was we created simple programs that would consume resources. And they were reasonably well calibrated, so we knew how many we would need to fire up in order to consume X percentage of resource. And so we would just fire them up and get to a certain percentage and let the system kind of stabilize a little bit, and fire up a few more, fire up a few more, fire up a few more, until we get to the point where we're like you know, 95, 100% uh, resource allocation being achieved. And we would let that run for 48 hours. And because there was some randomness to the programs in terms of what, what exactly they chose to do, you'd get fluctuation and you'd get uh, kind of uh, resonancy kind of things. When I say resonance, I mean two things trying to do the same thing or similar things at once. So um, that can work, and that, that does work. But for performance testing, definitely you want to, uh, you want to avoid that. OK. Um, testing the tests. Performance load and reliability tests are, are really pretty complicated things. And how do you know how do you know you did it right? I've been mentioning things that can go wrong and how, how do we how do we have confidence in those? Well basically what we need to do is we need to to test our tests. And the way that we're gonna do that is use of models. So you're going to create a model, either with a spreadsheet or with a simulation tool, uh, or maybe first a spreadsheet and then followed by a simulation tool, which is the way I've usually seen it done. And what you're going to do, the model is going to give you a prediction of what response time and resource allocation and so forth are going to be in a particular situation. The requirement specification is going to give you an expected result for what that response time and uh, resource allocation and so forth ought to be at a particular level of load, maybe requirement specification and design specification. And then the tests are going to go and test what those those actually are, the response time and resource allocation. And if 
you see that those three things are not aligned, then something's wrong. Now, it's not necessarily possible to say what exactly that something is. It could be that the model's wrong. It could be that the tests are wrong, or it could be that there's a bug in the system under test. But there's clearly something's wrong, and something needs to be looked into further to understand what, uh, what the source of the discrepancy is. So let me give you an uh, example of this, good, a positive example. Um, Internet Appliance Project, we were going to have at one point as many as potentially 50,000 of these out there in the field. Now, we wanted to test and know what, what, how things looked at 25,000, at 40,000, and at 50,000. So we had a production environment. Uh, we're lucky enough to be able to use the actual production environment because it was before things went live. And um, we had a realistic load generator, which was constructed out of pieces of stuff given to us by the developers who had been using this, these pieces of stuff to do performance testing at the, unit, at the unit level, which more on that later. So we used the load generator to crank up uh, to 25,000, 40,000, 50,000 level of load. Uh, and at those levels of load, not only were we checking response time and resource utilization, but we also had people running functional tests the same environment. The idea there being that this would uh, be interesting to know what the what the user experience is like when the application is when the system is so heavily loaded. And then, as I said, uh, you compare your test results against the simulation results. So here's an extract from our uh, performance uh, load and reliability results presentation that we gave to management after the first cycle of performance testing. And let's focus in on these uh, these IMAP mail servers here. So the simulation, the simulation tool, by the way, which was uh, Hyperformix, um, predicted that there'd be 45% server utilization at 25,000 users. Okay, and that's their prediction. And they predicted that the IMAP servers would saturate at 40,000. In other words, it would hit the 75 to 80 percent uh, utilization, which is usually about where bad things start happening. So did we see the 45 percent at 25,000? Yep. There's 41 percent utilization there. Because this is idle, right? So it's 100 minus 59. And uh, 45 percent. So that's actually right on the money there, right? So the test data and the simulation are in sync at that point now. And then also look at was the 40k, and that's that's means that we, our simulation might or our our test might bear out that simulation, but then that would be a case where we would have a discrepancy with the expected results, because the expected results were to be able to support 50,000 users. And not only were we able to do this in a, a, um, in a high level in terms of resource allocation, we were able to drill down to the individual um, transactions that were being carried out, IMAP transactions that were being carried out, and uh, look at what's, uh, what's the simulation versus what's the test observation. So you see, here with the connect, you know those guys. Those guys are pretty well aligned. 0.74 versus 0.77. But you get the banner. Obviously, wow. You know, you got a big discrepancy here. So somebody's going to have to look at that, understand what that is. Authorize. You know, kind of, sort of. It's <laughs> not a straight line there, but it's close enough, right? Um, it's a fairly small discrepancy. Here, um, this one is another one that's like, like, yeah, you know, if you squint and hold up one finger, it kind of looks the same. <laughs> you know, they don't, don't seem to be big, a big discrepancy there, though. It's, you know, more significant um, than some of the others. But, you know, this guy is just, this is the killer here. You know, this, this is 